On this episode of Still Loading, an MMO that time forgot. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval. And today on the show, it's the actually, I don't know if this is going to be the first episode outside of Mario Month or the third episode after Mario Month, but this is one of the first that I'm recording after Mario Month. So today we are talking about uh, a, another area of game history that really doesn't get talked about much and not the idea of MMOs. MMOs are talked about ad nauseum because obviously World of Warcraft is still gigantic and there's still people that you know play it. But as Longtime listeners of the show know I like to place a spotlight on areas of game history and video games that don't really get the attention that they deserve. And with me today is Matt from the YouTube channel Computer Gaming Yesterday to talk about an MMO that was an MMORPG. And for those who don't know, maybe just, you know, maybe, maybe people don't, maybe there's some new listeners, maybe there's some people who've never played the genre. MMO stands for Massive Multiplayer Online. RPG role playing game. So it is a big, it's an RPG with a shitload of people all playing at once. I mean, that is a real, that is a, a real bare bones description of the genre. Uh, like I said, with me today is Matt from Computer Gaming yesterday to talk about an MMO that really has not gotten its just do. It's, some, it's, a, it's a game that uh, is hugely influ- influential on the genre and really does not get talked about. And Matt here has done an entire documentary of over on youtube all about this game so with me today to talk about the dark age of camelot from mythic is matt from Q- computer gaming yesterday matt how are you doing today i am doing very well and thanks so much for having me on to talk about dark age of camelot i think it's going to be fun thank you for coming on thank you for reaching out it's like like i was telling you off mic i always like talking about areas of game history that i know very little about and being full disclosure listeners i know fucking nothing about this game <laughs> other than what was in matt's excellent documentary and there's a lot of cool things to unpack with this game and uh i will say you there's a lot of information that you pack into this 40 minute documentary like i've had and i i don't mean this as an insult but i've had to watch the first half a bunch of times to cuz you just there's so much there there's so much so many stories to tell so i i think to start this off and just kind of begin this episode explain to the listeners what is the dark age of camelot in in i guess in kind of a nutshell yeah so um it is a so dark age of camelot is a 2001 mmorpg it's from mythic entertainment and uh it is a 3d mmorpg in the style of everquest or world of warcraft uh but the things that are more unique to dark age of camelot are that it has a three faction system with each faction having its own uh, classes and races and its own zones for the large, the largest part. And in addition to that, it's got a realm versus realm combat system. That's a player versus player combat system that puts the different factions against each other to control keeps and eventually some relics that provide bonuses. And those were both things that, especially at the time that was released in 2001, uh, it was uh, very unique and not uh, really, at least in the West, uh, not of any other MMOs really were doing the things that Dark Age Camelot decided to come out and do. So, um, and it's also been very influential since then. So it's kind of a shame that I think uh, besides the most dedicated fans, a lot of people have kind of uh, forgotten the influence of Dark Age of Camelot, but even though it is still there look, lurking in the background. <laughs> I would even say it's not even that people have forgotten it. It's that people just didn't know it existed. Like I didn't know it existed until yeah. you reached out to me to to talk about it. And watching, I mean, just even looking at some of the video clips that you got of the game, a lot of the HUD reminds me a little bit, and the UI reminds me a little bit of WoW from what I know of WoW. I'm not, I don't know how much that UI has been updated over the course of it. the game history. Obviously things change a lot when you go from, 
you know its initial release up to it's still it's still active today run by fans though correct or is it is it still it's run, run by, by um actually is run by broadsword i think it's broadsword entertainment and that company is headed by rob denton who is one of the original founders and of mythic and one of the programmers on the game so uh it is still being run by one of the same people that created it oh that's so cool so it's still in the hands of the creators for all intents and purposes yes yes it is that's they really also cool. run ultima online interesting oh. enough so so one of their competitors so they run both one of their original competitors and their own game still yeah yeah that's kind of funny so what I found interesting about uh, your your video is that you you start back at the beginning and the origins of Mythic as a developer, like how kind of a lot of their key players yeah. got started in the industry, and a lot of them. If it, this is part of the section that I had to watch a few times just because it, it's so much information, but if I remember correctly, they get started at doing as uh, uh, hosting muds, like hosting yes. muds from their house now listeners a mud stands for is an acronym for multi-user dungeon they're kind of like the pre- the predecessor to what we would know as mmos but i actually don't even fully understand the concept of multi-user dungeons i understand that a lot of users will you know well, it was back in the 80s so there's not really much of an internet but you would call in on your phone line through your computer like it was still the internet technically right yeah, sort of. uh, well, um, I guess it, it depends. It would be an internet. It's not, I guess it the wouldn't internet, necessarily be the internet we know today, <laughs> but it was it was a net, an internet, I guess. No definitive article. It's just an internet. Y- yeah, I, it, yeah. It almost seems like you would dial into the computer. Like, so like now, you know, with, with the internet, you can just go to a web browser, type in an address, and you have access to every server that's um, that's at least not on the dark web but every server available i'm assuming back here with this you had to know the specific number to dial in you know it wasn't yeah. necessarily an i i mean maybe it was an ip address but essentially they and that's in your video that you said they the one guy i forget which guy it was but he had to convince the phone company to get a bunch of different phone lines so that way more people could call into his mud right. server yeah, the the way that Mark Jacobs, who's one of the co-founders of Mythic Entertainment and kind of the the biggest uh, voice, I think, that surrounded Dark Age of Camelot, kind of the uh, face of the game, he started with uh, a mud that he ran out of his house and he had like 20 phone lines that he got connected to his, his house so that people could call in. And he probably got more than that later, but he had to convince the phone company that like <laughs> to do this because they were really skeptical about why he wanted so many phone lines to his private residence. I would be skeptical too. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, so, and that was 1984. Um, so that was really like the very first, not the very first days, but very close to the very beginning of, of, of MUDs. I mean, before that, there was like Aradath, um, or our death was his. There was the scepter of Goth was the one that was before it that Mark Jacobs played, and then he got mad at it, so he made his own called our death. And then there okay. was the original Mud, which was called Mud, Mud One, as it's sometimes known. <laughs> There's a few others. I mean, um, the thing about Muds is they kind of spun up so. In no. such various ways that there's tons that you can't really even count them, and, and many are the, probably lost to history. But and I think real quick, just to I almost have a visual example to describe visually what a mud would do. I understand it, well, it was all text based, right? It was essentially tec- like a like generally not a not a text adventure, but essentially like a uh, a game that was all text based that multiple people would log into and play the game with each other or against each other or something like that, whatever, whatever the game was like. I I mean, obviously each mud's rules would have been different, but yeah. Yeah. If you can imagine like if it was an elder scrolls themed mud, let's say, you know how they always start the prison cells, right? So you Mm -hmm. would log into the game and it would say, you are in a prison cell, uh, but this is a multiplayer game. So it might say, Oh, uh, you know, and you are with uh, uh, Squire Trelawney over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Is and it will just say that in text, um, and it'll say like, "Oh, there's a 
steel bars and there's a wooden chair and, and whatever else in, is in the room in text. And then you can type in your commands to say like you want to interact with something or you want to observe the other players there, or you can chat, you can chat with the other players. Um, and it kind of progresses in like a tick system. Generally it's like, mm -hmm. uh, based on like a set period of time. Um, so it is happening in like real time. Um, and, and that's generally how MUDs went. And most of them were, did very little graphics at all. If it was any graphics would be like some of the, uh, ASCII art kind of stuff. Uh, and, but when you were connecting over, you know, those old modems that struggled to, you know, send <laughs> any data at all, yeah, <laughs> that was really the only way to do it, uh, to get people to network together and to be able to play online. Now, I want to uh, flash forward to the beginning of Mythic because one of the reasons I know there's a lot of interesting stuff in between. So if there's anything you want to highlight between like the inception of like, you know, the 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 founders of Mythic, the, the game developer and, you know, I know we, we basically went from like how Mythic kind of got its proto start and now we're jumping straight there. But I don't want to take all the info from your from your video. I want people to go and watch your video. That's <laughs> kind of a little bit of the purpose of this too, yeah, yeah. is to, to direct people to your channel. Um, and so I don't want to go beat by beat through your whole video. So if there's any highlights you'd like to to touch on, feel free. But the then mythic essentially and actually sorry one of the other things i thought was really cool i'm jumping all over the place i apologize uh because leading up to the creation of mythic you you play you painted a really good picture of the world of like the the kind of what the the sphere in their sphere of the game world what the industry was like how every uh it wasn't really a necessarily muds but like online games were tied to the online services like whether right, it was yeah. AOL or CompuServe and I think that's I legit did not know that I think it's such a fascinating thing that would be like now uh you get you see like a, it would be like World of Warcraft you can only play WoW if you are a Verizon subscriber or something like that exactly like it would, it'd, it'd be like having specific games tied to specific internet service providers which is such a strange concept to us now but back then it was so different i had no idea about that yeah exactly and that's how that's how it was with um so dragon's gate was one of the mud it was a mud that uh was not mythic i think later it was managed under the mythic name uh after the, the company got its start officially but it was uh made by people rob denton uh and i thought i think matt fear was on that one too um for the genie network the which was run by general electric and that was just sort of a, a way of getting people in the door to try and get people in the door say hey we have this mm -hmm. really cool mud you can come play this america online they famously had neverwinter nights which is one of those games that will be pointing to sometimes as like this is like the first mmo you know depending on how you define it um, but if you wanted to play those kind of games, you generally had to be on that network. And it was the same as if like you wanted to talk to someone too. Like if you wanted to instant message, like over AL instant messenger in the early days, you know, you were only talking to other people on AOL. So it was just these mm -hmm. different spheres, you know, not connected until around 94 when, you know, the, the internet and the World Wide web starts to get rolling. That makes sense now why it's like the WWW is so important because it literally, it, it, de right, yeah. it, it like almost desegregated the internet from the individual ISPs to the world wide web. That's wild. I had no, sorry. It, it's just, there's a whole bunch of stuff where like I early internet, I know very little about. So this is really interesting to me. Um, now, to kind of go into the game itself, uh, one of the things I found super fascinating about it was that the engine that it was based off of was kind of a Doom clone, sort of. It was like a paintball Doom clone. It had a very interesting lineage, yeah, because they started with this engine for a game called Splatterball, um, which was, uh, I think that one was America Online. And it was a as a paintball game, you know, mm -hmm. as the name would imply. But it it ran and looked like Doom, so you can kind of think of it as like 
a more kid friendly kind of doom thing. <laughs> like like Chex can, Quest, but for paintball. Yeah, you, yeah, you can go on there <laughs> and you can you can shoot at people, um, but it's just paintball guns, you know. And people get splattered, and that's it. And it, it was online; it was multiplayer. I think I'm almost certain it was exclusively online multiplayer. I don't think there was even any bots or anything back then. Um, so they put that game on and and started to iterate on it that they started to iterate it through different games and different versions um they had some games called mate a game called mage storm that was a an, another online arena style game but this time you were mm-hmm. playing mages uh and then there was spellbinder uh the nexus conflict which was another game of that style and came even later in like 1999 and each one of these games they sort of increase their graphical fidelity they they make a leap from splatter ball uh to mage storm and it's like from the 2.5d to 3d and then like i think mage storm to spellbinder was from 3d to hardware accelerated potential 3d and you can see okay. major improvements in the graphical fidelity with each one the spell effects or uh the 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 detail in the 3d models the size of the levels so you can see how they're learning over time to make it better and better and better uh and then of course eventually that leads to dark ages camelot which was uh, a much wider scope and scale uh than anything they had done before um and just they went from doing arena shooters to doing what was at the time some of the biggest MMO zones you would find in any 3D games, but I would say probably the biggest uh, at the time in 2001. Uh, so it was quite the leap, and it's really funny to see that they managed to take that same engine and wrangle it into <laughs> yeah. what it eventually became. It almost kind of reminds me of like what Valve has done with the Source engine, where it like it's been going on for so long, it, like. For for the Source Engine has been around since what half there well hold on was the Source Engine Half Life Two or Half Life One? Um, I think it was one. Was it? and then they upgraded. Or it no, for maybe like, it was two. I don't honestly two. remember. I, I it just kind of reminds me because I remember like you would see late Valve games still running the Source Engine even though it was like a decade old at that point. Right, Same with yeah. like the Call of Duty engine like that. Um, but that was more infamous because like I feel like. The Source Engine at least still looked really good up even up until I don't know if there's been any games made with it recently, but like the Call of Duty engine, they hadn't changed it since like Modern Warfare, and, <laughs> and there were so many games and they were still yeah. utilizing that. Um, in researching this, what was some of the hardest? Like, what were some roadblocks that you ran into? Because there's there's a lot of information in this documentary, and I, I think it'd be interesting just to see, like, as someone who likes to study video game history, I'm always interested in how others get over roadblocks. Like, how difficult was it to research this topic? Because you have a lot of info in this documentary. I think that one of the uh, more difficult things was that there's... I, I wasn't... I had a hard time getting a hold of anyone that was with Mythic, uh, to find out like details about it. I mentioned mm-hmm. Rob Denton still running Broadsword Entertainment and there's still a company over there. But uh, a lot of individuals who are associated with the early days of MMORPGs have uh, very minimal online presences. And this is not just a Dark Age Camelot thing. Um, it's hmm. So it, it was kind of hard to, to, to get a hold of anyone to be like, oh yeah, like they can talk about that directly but fortunately uh the internet archive exists and there is quite a bit of information that you can find if you go down the right rabbit holes i think that the uh the most valuable thing for researching these kind of topics is to you know find a fan site that Mm -hmm. you can find a copy of that exists and then just start clicking on links in the internet archive and a lot of them don't work even though if even if they are supposedly archived because a lot of stuff that doesn't get crawled correctly or uh, Mm -hmm. that happens a lot with forums in particular but you know eventually uh, you can start to find some very interesting information Uh, also magazines were great for this and i had a few books with some information in it as well Um, yeah so there's this book called developing online games i'm gonna pull it down here developing online games an insider's guide by jessica mulligan 
and Bridget Patrobisky. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was like written around 2001 and it includes a lot of, it's supposed to be a developer's guide for yeah. making an online game. It includes a lot of interesting information and insider insights about MMOs from that era. And there's also a postmortem of Dark Age of Camelot in this book, oh. uh, which is not. So there's a postmortem of Dark Age of Camelot, also arch- archived on an old version of like, uh, what was it? Game Developer Magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not quite the same. It's not the same as the one in this book. Was it so, done by two different people? Like a postmortem? No, it's by the two- same. It, it's same Matt Fireroar do- that did both <laughs> of them. Weird. Uh, but the one that's in this book has a little bit different information than the one that's online. So, uh, that was a, a really like great resource for finding some lesser known, uh, tidbits. Cause I think the things in that book have not really been widely, uh, distributed online. Interesting. Uh, how long did it take you to research this? Cause if you're crawling through the internet archive, I imagine that probably took a fair amount of time. Yeah, I don't know. I was probably working on the video for a couple months. Um, it definitely t- it definitely took some time <laughs> with these I longer mean, I, videos. I can see. I mean, I'm looking at your your channel now. There is a seventh ish seven ish. Oh my gosh, seven ish month gap between your right. history of Baldur's Gate two, which also looks really cool, and this up in this video. Uh, in your opinion, we, we you know we've we've talked a little bit about we've kind of done some broad strokes of the history of mythic you know very broad strokes. I know I left out a lot. Like I said, listeners intentionally, I want you to go watch the video. Um, but we've you know done some broad strokes on the history of mythic, your research on the topic. Now onto Dark Age of Camelot specifically. What do you think? is the reason this game is so influential. Like, can you cite some specific things that you feel like has, like it showed up first in this game and then influenced other MMOs or even maybe even not MMOs, just other games in general. So I think there's probably two main like things and we can maybe talk about them separately. So, Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll do the obvious one first. And the obvious one is the realm versus realm combat. And that had not been done really prior um let me think let me think let me think no not in the west at least i don't really know a lot about eastern mmos which are very big uh so i always want to sort of add that caveat but in the west uh there had definitely been pvp but it was generally uh ultimate online most famously it was like free-for-all pvp Mm -hmm. So it was people would form guilds and you'd have tensions in that way. But there was no overarching structure to it that was put down by the game itself, really. It was just people would form their own guilds or their own bands and kind of do what they wanted. Uh, Dark Age of Camelot added a structure to that, a game to that in the realm versus realm combat where there were keeps you could take. There were specific realm versus realm areas. And uh, there were eventually relics um, that you could capture that gave you a bonus. I think it was like a 20% bonus to like magic damage or melee damage, depending on what relic you captured, um, which is pretty substantial. And an MMO, that's like a, that's a big buff. So that's a a 20% buff is huge. People people (laughs) wanted those. People wanted those uh, relics. And that, um, that sort of structure, that three-sided structure, is something that you see retained in a lot of modern games, uh, a, lo- a lot of modern MMOs, at least, um, like Guild Wars 2 um, and Elder Scrolls Online and uh, New World, um, to name a few. I believe it was all, all three of those have three-sided structure, uh, structure to their, their gameplay. Um, and also have the concept of there being like objectives, keeps, things mm-hmm. you can capture and, and things that you want to get to give yourself some kind of bonus. And that really um, began with Dark Age of Camelot, although it would act, I should point out for people who are like really know their, their mythic entertainment, it really began with the Darkness Falls uh, mud, which was uh, made by Mythic prior to dark age of camelot and it had like it had, a had three faction structure. type of thing yeah it okay. was like i think it was chaos order chaos. and in evil 
I think those were the okay. three sides in that game, and uh, it's very similar structure, but it was it was a, a mud and not a graphical MMORPG. That's before we move on to the second thing that the second way that uh, Camelot influenced other games. I think that's interesting because one of the you know the the MMO that arguably killed both Camelot and almost all other MMOs, uh, World of Warcraft. It has a it's not three factions, but it's two factions and their pvp style when it's not like the open world pvp when you have the specific battlegrounds in wow it kind of like what you just described kind of reminds me of that of specific objectives capturing specific areas um and i I can't say definitively if wow was inspired by it but like you can you could at least make the argument just for the fact that this game came out three years prior to wow releasing i think wow was 2004 right yes Wow, yeah. it was 2004. And I think it was a partial inspiration. I think for a while, uh, World of Warcraft, the developers looked at that and probably were thinking, yeah, faction combat. Of course, they also had the World of Warcraft franchise anyway. So yeah, the that story already made an obvious that. connection to a two-sided um, sort of arrangement, which uh, is a difference. And I think probably something that has worked out negatively for World of Warcraft uh, because in general, World of Warcraft has a very big issue with as the servers age, they tend to just go towards being dominated by one side. Yes. It's hard to say if a Dark Age of Camelot, um, you know, if that was as popular as WoW for as long as WoW, if it would have similar problems. I, I'm not sure if it would totally resist it, you know, at that kind of scale. Mm-hmm. But it was definitely a bit of a better balance to have three sides so that there was a possibility that if you had two sides that were weaker, they could still kind of not necessarily work together, but like they could at least stop attacking each other as much and like focus on the stronger side to try and balance that out a bit better. I I agree. And I I do want to talk a touch on a little bit more in a little more detail about how wow kind of ended up killing this game but i there's one thing i i thought was interesting i I actually would like to get your opinion on this there was a commenter on your video this isn't someone shit posting i promise you (laughs) i I would i wouldn't just read a bunch of negative comments (laughs) i don't see any to be fair like almost everything i see is really positive but the one thing they said one of the reasons that this game ended up kind of getting killed by wow was that the expansions for the game were very weak they consider the expansions very weak uh the uh, what let me read exactly uh if dark age of camelot had not been weakened by a series of very bad expansions it would have better resisted the onslaught of wow do you from what your research i don't know did you i don't know if you played the game or not but do you agree with that do you think that's a, a interesting point it's a common opinion um in the community, I think. Mm -hmm. And it is somewhat, it's hard to necessarily disagree with it in the sense it's like, well, you know, if you didn't like the expansions, then you didn't like the expansions. Fine. Like I understand that. Um, I do think though, as I've looked over the MMORPG genre in general, it's kind of funny. It seems like every game that's not wow, suddenly had a bunch of bad expansions around the time world of Warcraft came out. And Mm. I think that was probably more uh, the case that, you know, a relative comparison of these two games Mm -hmm. left a lot of players to veer towards World of Warcraft. Uh, Because, yeah, EverQuest, you talk about the same period for EverQuest, people will say, man, those expansions, they were kind of weak. You know, Anarchy Online, the later expansions, oh, they didn't really do enough to update that game. Um, Ashron's Call, you know, well, I mean, they did kind of mess that up by releasing that sequel so early. But uh, but yeah, I think that they had some good ideas in their expansions and that World of Warcraft really kind of pushed those aside uh, because it was just a newer game, better executed. Uh, and also this was still kind of that period of time where graphics were accelerating mm-hmm. super rapidly. So like... You know, today, if an MMO is three years newer, everyone's like, who cares? Like, whatever. They yeah. probably look the same. Who knows? Mm-hmm. You know, but like back then, it was like, whoa, mind blowing. This is so much bigger and cooler and smoother. 
And I don't, just don't think that Dark Age Camelot was able to compete against that. Do you think, I, I feel bad even bringing this up. Like or I shouldn't say bringing this up, but like I feel bad for bringing up WoW is what I'm trying to say. Because I feel like, <laughs> do you well, feel... Well, that's a game most people would play. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> what was it? At one point in time, I remember seeing news articles, like there was enough people playing on it that it literally could have populated a real life city like there was millions of people playing well yeah it was like 10 million was an active user base Mm -hmm. at one point but um the the reason i feel bad bringing it up is that because wow ended up just taking over this genre for so long and nothing has really other than final fantasy has given it a run for its money between final fantasy 11 and then 14 actually is super popular after they Re, after they did the rebirth of that game that's a whole nother story though uh i there's not a lot of mmos i feel like that have stood up against world of warcraft so i always feel bad bringing up wow because there's so many other mmos out there and it's unfortunately they're always going to get compared to wow and i feel bad because i almost feel like they aren't allowed to stand on their own merits. Like, do you feel like doing research for this? That is a common issue because almost everything gets compared back to world of Warcraft. I think it can be a common issue in the sense that for a lot of people and this, and this is a reason why I like doing these videos. I think for a lot of gamers, um, who are in the MMO genre, it started at World of Warcraft for them. That's probably mm-hmm. true of the bulk of people who are playing MMORPGs started. right now. Actually, no, I started with RuneScape, but sorry, go on. Yeah, I mean, that was also a big one. But it's a, for a lot of people, you know, it sort of started with World of Warcraft, mm. and um, which was is a great game, but there's a lot of ways that it was inspired by its predecessors. And I think it's interesting to see uh, how that was the case. Cause it tells you a lot about, you know, what works and what doesn't in MMORPGs. It also tells you a lot about how just uh, opinions and narratives change over time. Um, because I mean, since even the release of World of Warcraft, we have seen some things go in the other direction right because some people are very not happy with world of warcraft now and yes look at some of its systems and say that's not the right thing even though those were the things that kind of allowed it to displace dark age of camelot and everquest um things like having some instancing having very directed raids having you know a a much easier new player experience uh are all things Mm -hmm. that um were very essential to World of Warcraft displacing Dark Age Camelot. It's funny because, you know, you're 100% right. And it's funny. So people have gotten so upset at WoW that they recreated the original version with WoW Classic. And they're literally (laughs) going through the exact same cycle again of playing through Nilla, Burning Crusade, you know, Wrath of Lich King, all that stuff, and going through the exact same patch lineup. It's it's so freaking surreal to see people are just you know just living it all again. It's very it's very interesting. Um, now I want to bring it back to how we kind of started this part of the conversation. I really enjoyed this. Just kind of uh, thinking about the the state of how MMOs influence each other, but that that this whole thing started because of the first thing you said about um the what are one of some of the biggest takeaways of how D- camelot influenced other mmos and you know you, you talked about the faction combat so that was the first one you said there was two main things so what is the second thing that you wanted to talk about with this so the other thing and, and this also um kind of ties into uh some of the topics I just talked about with World of Warcraft, with it being easier to play, Dark Age of Camelot actually was an an easier to play MMO and a more approachable MMO when it came out. And Mm -hmm. so the very first MMOs were pretty focused on the idea of being graphical MUDs. Mm -hmm. Um, And that had some limitations that just kind of came through on the interface the ways players interacted the way the classes were designed and dark age camelot came out it looked nicer it had a more uh pleasing user interface i mean if you look at the first interface for a request for example that very first interface where it's like half or more the screen is like hot bars and buttons and there's this tiny section where you can actually see the world which they redid pretty quickly after release but 
you look at that and you compare it to like what Dark Age Camelot looked like when it came out in 2001. And Dark Age Camelot, it looks a lot more appropriate for a 3D MMORPG. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the monsters were not as uh, unforgiving. Uh, they were a little <laughs> easier in general. They were, you know, not as likely to absolutely destroy you. There was less of a f- focus on having to have a group to do anything in the player versus environment combat. Uh, there was also a very wide variety of classes in that game, more so than any of the others that had come before it. So it was very nice to re-roll different classes and races if you were like a role-playing player and you wanted to get it that way. There were horses that could tra- take you from different cities and fast mm-hmm. travel you in a way, which you did not have mm-hmm. in earlier MMORPGs. If you were one of the guinea where you were walking and you were trying to find a port, so these were all things that made Dark Age Camel in general a lot more approachable. And that is the main thing. If you go back and read the reviews of Dark Age of Camelot when they when the game came out, that is the main thing that people talk about as being the great thing about Dark Age of Camelot. Not the Realm versus Realm Combat, which people only really uncovered later once they had all leveled up and they started to be like, oh, wow, like this is really fun. When like yeah. it first came out, it was just, this game is a little less unforgiving. It's easier to understand the interface, looks great, has all these really cool classes. And in other words, it was a good role playing game. And I think that was, that is a particularly easy thing to lose in retrospect. Um, but to me, it's kind of like that, the missing link that you put between an EverQuest in a World of Warcraft, between them you have Dark Age Camelot, and, and it's not quite to the World of Warcraft level of polish and easy to get into. Yeah, but it's also quite a step up from what EverQuest was at release, and I'd say also like Ashron's Call, and certainly also online. It's interesting. I almost feel like in in game history, it's the stepping stones that get overlooked a lot. Like you always know something for the base entry and then the big polished entry, but you kind of overlook the stepping stones of a lot of the, the lead up to it and not everything, of course, but um, I think back on, I mean, this isn't the best example because the second game in the series is still well known. But if you look at like super Mario, right, obviously the original game is I, and then Super Mario Bros. Everyone, when people look at those three games on the NES, and we're going to talk about the American Super Mario 2, not the uh, original Japanese. But like when you look at those three games on the NES, people would always look at the first and third. And people like the second. It's still popular. But it's by comparison, it's usually overlooked compared to the first, third, and then Super Mario World and whatever the more polished ones are. But Super Mario Bros. 2, even though... Once again, I know this is a weird example because it was meant to be another game and blah, blah, blah. That uh, That's a whole other story for that's not part of this podcast. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that Super Mario 2 allowed Mario to be weird. It, uh, it added a whole yeah. level of uh, new ideas, it had a whole a bunch of new ideas to the game. Not necessarily on purpose, because as we know, you know, it was originally Doki Doki Panic, but it, it's it's that it's still that stepping stone game that gets overlooked a lot. Likewise, um, even though it's not always as popular, uh, Zelda Two: The Adventure of Link it gets overlooked compared to original Legend of Zelda and Link to the Past, because Link to the Past is the polished version right. of the original Legend of Zelda. And Zelda Two, I have not played it enough to really tell you what those things are that it really like polished or that that it's the stepping stone for it but they obviously had to learn a whole bunch from it otherwise you wouldn't have gotten a link to the past like they learned stuff from that game and it gets overlooked and i feel like to tie this back now with the dark age of camelot dark age of camelot is that stepping stone that gets overlooked because wow is is WoW is the polished version of Dark Age of Camelot and EverQuest is the one that started it for all intents and purposes. Obviously, there's previous MMOs like we, you know, multi-user dungeons, however however far back you want to go with this uh, definition of MMO. But for all intents and purposes, kind of like 
we were talking off mic about RTS is how Dune 2 is the true first, the, the real true first RTS game. There are games prior to that that had RTS elements, yeah. even if they weren't all there. Um, so you always look at Dune 2 as like, well, this is, yeah, maybe in... Dune 2 is not the best example unless you're unless you're into RTS as most people who play computer games think of Starcraft or Age of Empires but that's neither here nor there. Well, you know, um, they look at like uh yeah, they'll look at like Age of Empires 2 or Starcraft and or Command then, and Conquer and then Dune 2 and then forget that there was dozens of games between those two. Yes, that we that's don't, a good way we to look talk at it. about it. Anymore. Uh Warcraft 1. People always forget about Warcraft 1, you know, yeah. orcs and humans. Yeah, because sure. Warcraft Two was huge, um, stuff like that. So I, it's, I don't know. It's just been really fun. It's really fun for me to learn about this because, like I, like we've been saying, this is the game that time for the the MMO that time forgot. I, I didn't even mean to tie this back to the tagline that I had at the beginning of the episode, but it kind of worked out. That's it's the MMO that time forgot. Um, now we've kind of talked about a lot about that. What makes Dark Age of Camelot so special? So th- just like expand on like what I said about it being a great role playing game. I think that is something that really should be remembered about Dark Age Camelot because if you you hit this game in 2001, you've got these wide open like very large zones. You've got these three realms based off the Norse, uh Celtic and like Arthurian tales mythology. Mm-hmm. You have all these cool classes. Like, I think the one I played the most was the, uh, it was like the Thane, and it was a, a Midgard class. And I was a troll, and like I had these hammers, and I was like throwing these hammers around, and there's like <laughs> lightning bolts and everything. And uh, it was a lot of fun, and it, it, it had a lot of room for expression in the role playing sense because you could be in all these different factions and have all these different in- interesting classes. And it kind of expanded that field of role playing in the MMO fantasy genre uh, out from what it had been before. I think, you know, like EverQuest has a lot of great stuff in it, uh, and it has a lot of classes actually. I think it had like 12 or 14 when it shipped. Mm -hmm. at launch um but it is still very much uh a dungeons and dragons kind of derived game uh so it's very much in that fantasy uh sort of lineage and dark age camelot goes a different direction and it it has a very broad direction and um I, i think that there are some some elements of that that we haven't really seen replicated since then uh very well um so i think that's really what makes dark age of camelot special i think to this day like it, it is fun to get in there you know and if you can get over you know the old interface and the fact that graphics are no longer great like it's fun to roll your troll and to just like be this big guy with these hammers and you can imagine your a, a, a giant uglier version of captain america or thor or something <laughs> of thor uh you know like throwing around your hammers it's it's really awesome um i also like the there's another really cool class is the cabalus you like would hmm. summon these these big like rock golem guys uh that would march around and then it, you were throwing out dots so it was kind of like you were a necromancer but you had these giant interesting statues fighting for you instead of skeletons and being sort of uh necrotically death themed um, it was kind of more of this like a dark arts kind of theme. Mm-hmm. So it was really cool. Uh, I, now, did you play Dark Age of Camelot as a kid, or was it something you kind of discovered as you kind of delved into your love of PC gaming? I did play it um, when I was when it came out. I played okay. a lot of MMOs when they came out, which I which I hmm. find makes like maybe a little bit unusual compared to some folks I talk these days. Because you with these days, because usually if they're interested in Dark Age Camelot or EverQuest or whatever, it probably means they played them a lot. Yeah, like most people who are want to look into these things up today have played that particular game a lot. But I kind of toured around, and I played a lot of different MMORPGs when they came out. Uh, but Dark Age Camelot was definitely one of my favorites. Um, and primarily because it, it did have such cool classes and cool race combinations and uh, a, such a big open world that, you know, going to that from, you know, even EverQuest two years before 
it was a big leap. It felt like a big leap. And um, there wasn't, you know, it, there wasn't any other competing games at that particular moment that were able to harness, I think, the technology quite as well as Dark Age Camelot. And also, it was a very large scale game with the realm versus realm combat. You had a lot of players sometimes uh, fighting it out. You'd have hundreds, dozens to hundreds in the biggest battles. And that was something that also other MMORPGs had not done a very good job of supporting up until that point. That's really... And I, I think you touch on this in your video. Wasn't it really difficult for those massive battles back then because of right, the yes. internet connectivity at the time? The interesting thing is it's still difficult. Oh, if, really? If you if you go into New World mm-hmm. or Elder Scrolls Online or Guild Wars 2 today and you end up in a battle with like 100 people in it, it's probably going to be pretty messy and it, your system is probably going to lag or you're going to have some characters not be rendering uh, until mm. you get unusually close to them and a variety of other issues. Uh, so this is a problem that I would say it's still not been solved to a satisfact to the satisfaction of players. Uh, but dark age of Camelot was really pushing it because they were doing this in 2001. A lot of people were still dialing up or, or connecting over dial up modems and yeah, there was lag and yeah, your system would like the frame rate would tank. But it did basically work. It did basically work. And that was kind of surprising. I I find it still kind of surprising that they managed to get it to work. And I think that's a testament to um, the history that Mythic Entertainment had making Mm -hmm. online games, not MMORPGs necessarily, but online games. They were they were they they were familiar with netcode, perhaps a little bit more than uh, some of their contemporaries were. And you talk about that on your video in your video too about how the development time for this game was bizarrely short compared to the scale of the game, and a lot of it was probably attributed to their history in online gaming. Like, how long was this development period? What it was less than a year, right? It was eighteen. About a year? It was eighteen months. It was a year and a months. half. That's still not a lot of time for an MMO in a firm year and a half. And I think that's like something the 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 note because. You know, you can kind of argue that like, oh, well, EverQuest didn't really hit development until 1997 and it came out in 1999 or like kind of a similar story. It wasn't well in development for like 10 years. It was like six years or something like five or six. 10 wouldn't make sense because that would be 94 would have been when they started it. Yeah, that was the case. But yeah, okay. Sorry. There there was a lot of like, um, I don't know, call it pre-production with those Mm -hmm. games. And. Dark Age of Camelot, though, they, they pretty much hit the ground running. They were, they saw EverQuest come out, and they saw Asheron's Call come out. Um, shoot, what was it? There was another one that year that I can't... I'm not... I'm forgetting right now. They saw those games come out, and they were like, we, we want to do this. Let's do this. We're going to make a game like this. And uh, they had one by, you know, the fall of 2001. And they did all of that work in those 18 months. And they were only able to do it because they had familiarity with making online games. And also because, as we talked about earlier, they had this engine they'd been working with. Uh, They had updated uh, to do the the graphics. The other element, which is interesting, that they they brought in was, I had mentioned the Darkness Falls mud. Um, And so that was a, a... the text-based game that they were running previously, they actually brought in server um, infrastructure code and database code from that game to use as the foundation of that code for Dark Age of Camelot. Mm-hmm. Um, and according to the Matt Matt Fire or one of the designers, they actually brought in the database uh, archive, the database archive of all the items in Darkness Falls text-based mud and they put that in as their starting point for the items in dark age of camelot and worked from there which very unusual and none of their competitors were doing that um they none of their competitors could do that because by and large uh 
all the other companies that were making MMOs at this time didn't really have either any experience. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I should really say developers. All the other developers that were making MMOs at this time uh, really didn't have experience making either any games at all, which was true of things like uh, EverQuest, where there was like one game under the lead designer's uh, belt beforehand mm -hmm. or online games, as I think was more true of also online. Um, you know, you could argue like Raf Costa had done some muds before then, but like it was pretty limited experience. And I think mythic had more when they went into this project than most of their competitors had. They also had a little bit of time to see what they had done wrong and kind of learn from their mistakes. And so they were able to put this project together super quick. And it's very impressive, especially considering that it wasn't cut back in size. It was huge. You know, yeah. as I mentioned, it's a huge game. And they made it in 18 months. That's just nuts to think about. Um, what Now, you can still play this game today. You talk about that in the video, and we, we touched on it a little bit before. My last couple of questions about the game itself, I have a few more questions for you. But the last couple of questions about the game itself, um, could no was this a subscription based thing did you have to pay a monthly fee to play yeah. this online okay yeah i think it started at 9.99 that was like the typical thing for the mmorpgs that were subscription based at the time mm -hmm. i don't think they went to 14.99 until like i think it was like everquest 2 might have been the first one that did it uh so it was subscription based and of course back then you know that was that was it like you paid your subscription and that was generally it there wasn't any like cosmetics to buy or anything like that yeah is there still subscription costs now to play it's it? free to play I, th I believe the model is free to play with subscription cost if you want to unlock a bunch of stuff um is how it works now and um if i recall right from the last time i played it it was structured in a way that made the subscription a pretty appealing option um, okay so you'd probably want to get the subscription if you were going to play it for any length of time Okay. Interesting. Um, so I want to wrap up, talk about the game because I do want to ask you about your YouTube channel uh, specifically, but is there anything else that you want to touch on the dark age of Camelot before we kind of shift focus over to your channel? Is there anything that I did not ask a question on that you think is worth mentioning? Well, you know, uh, maybe one thing to talk about to bring this sort of relevance to modern gamers uh, who are didn't play Dark Age Camelot, but maybe have played The Elder Scrolls Online or been heard of The Elder Scrolls Online or like The Elder Scrolls in general. Um, mm -hmm. So The Elder Scrolls Online, of course, is from Zenimax Online Studios. And uh, Matt Fyror is the head over there. You might have seen him on the latest Xbox uh, Game Pass live stream well i guess it wasn't live stream but the 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 last big thing they did uh, i think it was in january where they announced a bunch of games that were coming out to xbox over the next few months he was on there he was talking about outer scrolls online uh there were other members of mythic entertainment um that went to zenimax online studios and mm -hmm. i think kind of formed like a baseline for certain departments there and so a lot of the lineage of Dark Age Camelot, as far as design wise, you know, kind of made that move over the Zenimax. Um, and so you still have many of these individuals who worked on Dark Age Camelot. I'd say, I don't know, probably like around the quarter of the people that were there on the Dark Age Camelot team are now they're over there at Zenimax and they're working on Elder Scrolls Online, which is still, you know, a very popular MMO and still being updated to this day. And I think you can see the lineage if you play the, the two games side by side. I mean, there is a a, a, a realm versus realm kind of thing in mm -hmm. the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, I think there is a focus on having like a lot of different races and classes and being able to kind of play those in different ways and experience the role playing elements. And uh, I think it's I'm, I'm glad that that lineage has been maintained um, in this new game and continues to be developed. That's really cool. I uh, I didn't know that... Uh, you, you talk about it a bit in your video. I didn't know there was that many people who made the 
not the track, but the the transition over to Zenimax. So it's really cool that yeah, you can still see. Yeah, it seems like see. there was a bit of an exodus. Uh, yeah. and, and what happened at the end of Mythic's life was basically they got bought by EA. Everybody loves <laughs> electronic arts. <laughs> there and you go. And they launched all. Warhammer Online. Which was successful, in my opinion. Like it got, it sold a million copies uh, very shortly. Had like eight hundred thousand subscribers the first month. That's, 300, a, that's 000, a good amount of people. But it wasn't World of Warcraft. So Electronic yeah. Arts, because they had like ten million subscribers. So Electronic You're Arts going to make a dent in that. Like yeah, that's like you yeah, should be EA happy was you like almost nope. got a tenth of that. <laughs> And uh, they closed down Mythic. And um, so when that happened, a bunch of people went to Zenimax. Um, that just makes me more mad at EA. Like, I, like, <laughs> listen, we are, everyone knows EA is the villain in so many different stories. It just, but I think what just irks me is that it was a success. And they're like, it's not big enough of a success. Exactly. We're making money, but it's not enough money. It's like, dude, you pulled a tenth of WoW that had literally at that point had what what year did warhammer online come out do you know 2008 2008 so wow had four years to build up a a a group you know a a following a group a full user base like you're hoping that you can make that same amount in less time like that's not realistic yeah i know it's a bummer especially because warhammer online ended up getting taken down entirely and it only Mm. exists through uh like i think there's a fan emulated server now that is being worked on um but it's too bad because that was a good game um it was not a bad mmo and it uh, but they just they just tanked it they 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 abandoned it Mm -hmm. um ea did they left it they left it the rot (laughs) so as ea does with so many of their franchises unfortunately I um, mean, you know, hell, didn't they kill their uh, the Dead Space franchise just up until the remake recently? So even though it was a yeah. popular Well, the one I'll never it, forget them for is SimCity. <laughs> yes, because wasn't when they made the new SimCity didn't always have to be online yeah. and all that other shit. I fucking hate that stuff, yeah. man. Like, it's not I, great. Like, listen, I don't mind online play. I love online play and specific things, but you don't need, SimCity does not need to be online. It can be. It's a really cool idea to like have your city be quote unquote next to some other player's city and you can like connect to them and all this other stuff. But it, I haven't played SimCity in a lot in a while, so I don't know how, how much of an interactivity there would be between players. And that's a cool idea, but you shouldn't be forced to be online just because of whether it's DRM or whatever the hell they they yeah. want to justify it. Microtransactions, who knows? It was quite a debacle. Yeah, I, I remember that. That was like, what, 2013? Yep. Something like that? 2013? Yep. Um, okay, so that was our a little bit on Dark Age of Camelot. I, um, I'm actually, I, this was awesome, man. I had so much fun talking about the game, but, but I don't want to wrap up the episode yet. We're not even at an hour yet. I want to, I want to ask about you. I want the listeners to get to know a little bit more about you and, um, your channel. So you are the, uh, creator of, you know, computer gaming yesterday. And I want to, we talked a bit about it offline, but so for the users to know, what was your inspiration for starting this channel? So I had seen on YouTube and had been watching on YouTube quite a few channels like uh, the Gaming Historian that were doing gaming history. And I thought that stuff was was really awesome to watch. Uh, but the, the the thing was that I'm not a console gamer, really. Like I did have a Nintendo, an original NES and a Genesis, uh, but I only got like a couple games for those. Um and it wasn't really until the I got a, my family got a PC in like 1995, 1996 that I really started to play games. And I've always been more into PC games than any other. So, and I was looking around, I was like, well, I want to watch videos about this kind of stuff, but uh, there's not really that many videos that are going mm-hmm. into the same kind of depth about computer games. And I was like, well, okay, this seems like something I, I could make some videos on. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Has there been any topics that you've uh, kind of discovered that you were surprised how deep they ended up going or anything that you were surprised how interested you ended up getting in into it? 
if that makes sense. If that question makes I, sense. I think that um so the uh, I really liked looking at the World Champ strategy games. Um that was that was a lot of fun uh, because there were a lot of games that I saw in the early history of World Champ strategy games that um I hadn't heard of before and also because so some examples like when I can think of there's a game called Legionnaire which was like mm-hmm. 1984 and it does it's like it does look very much like a real time strategy game and a lot of elements um but I'd never heard of it before I'd never I'd never seen that I think most people have probably not heard of that that game um and so there was just like this all these different stepping stones up until you know Dune 2 which is kind of the game that started the genre as we know it today and I thought it was really it was a lot of fun to go back and see how those games had progressed and the different elements that were kind of brought forward over time and eventually coalesced and also the, the find out more about like what actually made from a tech from a technical perspective finally kind of made the genre possible on the PC mm-hmm. um, whereas before like dune 2 before that era it really was not it really probably was not possible due to the limitations of the tech and i man i should have had you on for my history of rts series like uh that i did in 2020 <laughs> yeah i'm always down to talk about real-time strategy games that's for sure i'm gonna have to have you on because I, I i took a hiatus from it because essentially what i was doing is every i was looking at every year and i was trying to do I mean, I would cover multiple years in an episode, but it was all scripted and scripted stuff takes, as you know, being a long a time, video yeah. con- <laughs> it takes a long time because even if even if you're a good writer, which I'm not, but if you're a good writer and you can write things out quickly and it's exactly how you want it to be, the recording of a scripted <laughs> anything is tedious at best. Uh, lots of small mistakes, lots of I mean, if, listeners, you hear all my ums and ahs and I edit out actually some of my long, awkward pauses where I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm saying in scripted stuff. That's even worse. Uh, So I would script everything and I would do it by year, but I got up to around command and conquer. And by that time, when, if you look at like the list of quote unquote RTS games on Wikipedia, that that was kind of like my starting point. And then I would try to branch out and find games. There was games that I found that weren't on that list or weren't talked about, which I thought was kind of cool. But when you get to that point, there's like 20 RTS games coming out every year. And I'm like, I don't oh, know yeah. if I have the effort more than that, the, the energy to like, look up 20 different rts games find which ones are kind of notable for like what mechanics have i not seen in an rts game yet type of thing well, and it's hard to maintain the narrative at that point you know to talk yeah. about it because i there's there's a magazine article i remember seeing in like computer gaming world and it's like 1996 or thereabouts and it's like here's the uh, the hot 100 rts games or something like it's like some absurd number might might be like 50 but it's like some really big number of rts games that are coming and that was a fun thing to read because there's a lot of games on there i'm like i never played that i never even heard of that but mm-hmm. at the same time you also on that list got have things like age of empires 2 you know and starcraft and and it's just crazy how big that genre got i mean it was like how the mmo genre got after uh, EverQuest, and then you started to see articles for PC game magazines that were the same thing. It was like, here's the hot 50 new MMOs that are coming out. And it just kind of took over the space. I almost feel like we don't have that happen as much anymore. Um, which is maybe I, maybe a good thing. Um, like a genre taking over the space yeah. type of thing. The closest thing I can think of was MOBAs for a little while, and then uh, Fortnite is now yeah. kind of like the that's like the PUBG and Fortnite is the current craze that's kind of taken over. I mean that on PC, but that's also bled over to consoles now because like MOBAs wouldn't are really hard to work on consoles, <laughs> understandably so. Uh, but even so, MOBAs come out came out of rts's uh, you know uh, oh my gosh defense of dota defense of the mm-hmm. agents that's what i was mm-hmm. trying to say and actually it's we i was on a podcast called retro hanger shout out to my buddies over at retro hanger retro hangover chris and shane they're doing a tournament on their patreon called king of games 92 and what that is is that they're basically looking at the they had a 
they got a whole bunch of panelists, myself and a bunch of other podcasters, and they look out they look at every game that came out in 92 and then we kind of picked like a top 20 of like in our opinion what are the top 20 most standout games of 1992 um mainly because of me i got dune 2 on the on the list no one else <laughs> knew about dune 2 i'm like this is really? the birthplace uh. of well it's cuz it's like i was saying how dune 2 is interesting where like when people think of rts games like the layman someone who's not necessarily into um real-time strategy games or or computer games like in general they will think of starcraft or age of empires or or, or command and conquer you know westwood's more popular rts than dune 2 um or the the refi- more refined version i should say uh and no one really knows about dune 2 and it's really a shame because it really we we talk about it on the episode it <laughs> so it it, it the king of games it pits two games head to head and you're not basing it off of gameplay because that's you know like for example dune 2 went up against a link to the past like dune 2 was the bottom uh-huh. seed link to the past yeah. was the was the number one seed who won the matchup you'll have to subscribe to their patreon and find <laughs> out. you can't really compare the two in terms of gameplay you know completely different you know mechanics not even anywhere close so what you compare it the way we compared it was um critical reception critical and commercial reception so what was it to the respective industries which uh we argued was a little bit inconclusive because it's hard to track pc critical commercial reception in the early 90s but you know that's yeah i won't won't go into all the arguments that we made but essentially one of the arguments there's four different topics that we discuss and then we vote to see who which game will move on well one of those four like discussion points is legacy um, and I, I don't mind spoiling this element, but Dune 2 won Legacy because the one that specific category, because if you think about Dune 2, if it was not for that game, you wouldn't it's not necessary that you wouldn't have the RTS genre, but it is the thing that influenced the most of the RTS genre. If it wasn't for Dune 2, you wouldn't have Command and Conquer. If you don't, if you don't have Command and Conquer, I mean, you might have Warcraft and Starcraft and all this other stuff, but like. Then you, but you don't have the RTS genre. Like that created the RTS genre. In turn, you get Warcraft Three, which then creates Dota, and the RTS genre also ended up influencing the MMOs to tie it back to Dark Age of Camelot because Warcraft is based off of the RTS. WoW is based off of the RTS series Warcraft. So you yeah, have yeah all of these things like MMOs, like what MMOs are now: World of Warcraft, uh, RTSs, MOBAs, all taking this tree of lineage back to dune 2 and it's like you can't necessarily say they wouldn't exist without it but this at the same time this is the starting point this is what set everything else in motion and so it it always blows my mind when nobody gives dune 2 the credit that it deserves regardless of their opinions on the gameplay itself it at least in my opinion like it really deserves that level of respect Uh, yeah do you agree i agree and i i I actually like i would take the legacy maybe even a little broader i think the thing that needs to be understood about real-time strategy games and their relevance and importance and popularity at the time is that before in this era of pc pcs not just pc gaming but pcs in general most people were probably using dos Mm mm-hmm and they were probably typing in text commands. Now, yes, the Mac existed and, you know, you had your Amigas and stuff, but those were much less popular uh, than, you know, the PC platform ended up becoming. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there were still limitations, too, where you would, you would run into maybe you have a graphical user interface, but you end up loading an app or a game and you end up getting a lot of text based stuff. And so along comes the the mouse which people are starting to get more and more and more of like it's more and more people are starting to get a mouse and along mm-hmm. comes graphical user interfaces and and the computers advanced enough that you can buy one and you can load up dos and you have this game that's you know i don't know what the i don't know what the resolution of dune is i'd say 640 by 480 it's probably pushing it but that, you know, i would something say it's like probably that. smaller than that it's probably like yeah. 320 by 240 or something something like that <laughs> but 
it's you've got like 20, 30, 40 things are all moving on the screen at the same time and you can click them and then you can tell it go over there. And and that was not something that happened <clears throat> a lot, uh, you know, prior to this, uh, especially on the PC platform, which is, you know, became the most popular. Um, and I think that that is why RTS games were such a revelation is that sort of immediate it did for like it was doing for games what windows was doing for the operating system there's a lot of people mm -hmm. when they got windows myself included that was the first time you saw a graphical user operating system a graphical a gui you know like before mm -hmm. that i'd not seen it computers at my school they were old apple twos they didn't have any graphics i you know like I'd never seen a, a, a graphical user interface before. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, I can click things. I can move things around. Same thing with Dune 2. It's like, wow, I can click this and I can tell this unit the move over there. And I mean, obviously that's a big deal. And it had a big impact mm -hmm. on all forms of, uh, of gaming ever since, especially in the PC, well, obviously in the PC space. I'd never really even thought about it that way. Like I, because I I'm a little bit younger than you, so I ha I kind of always grew up with GUIs as like something that I was just used to or graphical user interfaces and whatnot. So like I didn't really have to deal with just computers that were essentially command boxes, you know, or just typing in what you needed to do, what you wanted the computer to do instead of just clicking on something. Um, that that's I don't know that's that's crazy, and, and I forget how we even got to this. I I was talking about <laughs> oh I was saying how like I needed to have you on the history of RTS, and we just kind of yeah yeah, yeah. went from there. Yeah, that's exactly what, what happened. And, and when was the last time a genre of games really kind of took over a medium or took over a platform like that the way RTSs did in like the mid nineties to like mid aughts a little before then or whatever um whenever i don't know you actually you actually to shout out your channel once again you have a whole video about the death of rts games which i have not been able to watch yet but uh you you talk about that so i'm excited to kind of dive into that myself um what types of topics to, to bring this back to your channel what types of topics do you try to search for to cover uh, so since this dark age of camelot video came out you did another video called uh based off a canceled lord of the rings mmo but are there any other like like what are the types of things that you look for when you're trying to find topics for your videos so at the moment, I am digging around a lot in MMORPGs. I really do want to uh, try and cover all of these uh, like pre-World of Warcraft MMORPGs. And in fact, I would like to cover World of Warcraft. Uh, you know, there there is, a, a I think, what, the 20th anniversary of that game coming up uh, next year. Next so year, yeah. I might like to have a really big video covering that. Um, but... A lot of those earlier MMOs are forgotten, and especially when you move past, like even Dark Age of Camelot or Ashron's Call or Anarchy Online, and you start to get into things that are even like a little bit beneath that. Um, there's a lot of interesting stories there that are not really surfaced anymore. The Lord of the Rings MMO I thought was a really like interesting example because obviously the Lord of the Rings is really. <laughs> A, a big franchise mm -hmm. uh and uh so there was going to be this whole mmo and it was going to be made by sierra which, wow okay yeah you know like retro pc gamers like yeah you know how sierra is Who king's sierra quest is? right that's if i remember they did yeah. king's quest and police quest i always found their name interesting because it was sierra online and i'm like but a lot of their games were on dash online. line yeah i was always so confused by that like i i know it's on dash line but like as you know when you first hear it you're like what do you mean online you're, it, we know they, they had a network of their own for a little bit that's um, interesting I did not it know was that. like a america online competitor it didn't do that great oh. but the that's, yeah so they kind of had their own i like their own homegrown isp that didn't do well yeah the idea was that you could log in and it would be like a, a disneyland for sierra games on your uh on your computer and so mm -hmm. it would have like a lot of like sierra game themed kind of stuff all over it and at the same time you'd still be able to like go on and like shop chat do emails and so on and so forth um so that's why they had the online in there there's a little That's bit of a marketing ploy 
in some in some That's kind of cool. I did not know that. You, you're right. They they are mostly known for more single player stuff. But they were going to do the Lord of the Rings MMO. Um, but unfortunately, this was towards the end of Sierra's run, and mm-hmm. um, it did not work out. Now, what I was oh man, uh, I just thought about this. Now you were in thinking of Lord of the Rings. To tie it to tie it quickly to what we were talking about with RTSs before, in doing research for my history of RTSs, one of the earliest, uh, it was one of the first licensed RTS games was a Lord of the Ring game. It yeah. wasn't once again not a true RTS. It was it was essentially like RTS style, where it's you know top down, you're controlling individual units and characters across a screen, but you're not really building an army. Army, you're just kind of basically taking the like frodo and the whoever i forget yeah. which it might have been like even controlling the, the it was kind of like controlling the whole like narrative of the game but through of, like an rts camera or the lord of the rings from an rts yeah because you had yeah. the the hobbits and they were like traveling along to try and get the mm-hmm. ring there but then you also had like control of like knights in like gondor and they you and then the enemy had the ring race and they were, like come out and try to get frodo um which a really interesting concept kind of like this yeah like that done at like huge scale today with modern hardware such a weird thing and i was so i want to shout out quick because i i I don't know if i referenced it in my history of rts series but one of the things that i also used as a reference besides uh the wikipedia list ars technica has an article from richard moss who's also kind of a computer historian he's written a lot of books about game history especially on the mac i think he did a whole mac based gaming book uh, a couple of years ago but uh he has a very long and detailed article on ars technica about the history of rts and he covers a lot of the major highlights and i i didn't want to copy off of him especially because that's obviously it's plagiarism but I, I used his as like his paper as like okay so here's what he considers these highlights let me see what's in between let me see what i can dig into in between and one of the things he left out was this lord of the rings game which i thought was I mean, that's that's interesting you don't bring that up because it's the first one that I could find. I'm not saying definitively it is the first licensed kind of RTS like genre like style game, but it it's it's licensed and I feel like that should be at least somewhat noteworthy because you don't normally see a lot of licensed stuff like that. Yeah. Especially in genres like this. Um though now you do, but it's because I guess Warhammer technically would be a license because it was a tabletop game that turned into this, but um yeah so i i do want to start wrapping up this episode we've been going on for a little bit and i want to uh start wrapping this up but is there any final thoughts or anything you want to talk about that we did not get to uh talk about whether it's for dark age of camelot or anything else you want to highlight about your youtube channel and then after that feel free to talk about you know social media any plugs that you want to do anything you want to like promote for your channel and all that good stuff so i do want to highlight how to play Dark Age of Camelot. I always like to do that at the end of videos about the games that I covered. That's good. Let's bring it well. back to how we kind of started this. Let's let's yeah, bring it so back to you the beginning. Play, Dark if you Age like, of you want to check out the salary, you want to check out a piece of you know gaming history. Uh, there's two ways you can do it. One is the official servers through Broadsword Entertainment. You can buy. Well, I believe, like I said, they are they are free to play. So you can go in. I think there's limitations on classes and races and stuff like that. Or you can get a subscription. And you can play it that way. And that's sort of an updated experience um, that's got the expansions and whatnot. There's also unofficial servers. Um, I don't think that they are officially endorsed. So keep that in mind. It's a different situation than Project 1999 with EverQuest, which is officially endorsed. Uh, But there are fan emulated servers. They generally uh, focus on the original release of Dark Age Camelot. and do not include much of the expansion content. And there's, uh, if you just go to the Dark Age of Camelot Reddit, you're going to see what the uh, latest ones are. They seem to spin up. It seems like the community spins up servers fairly regularly. It's kind of like they do their own time locked progression thing, except spontaneously. And there'll mm-hmm. be like a new server every like year or two, and everyone goes and joins that, and it's really popular for like six months. So that's how you can play the game uh, today. Uh, if you want to get into Dark Age of Camelot. And uh, I also, I do have a video coming up that's going to touch on Mythic Entertainment um, again and on Dark Age of Camelot again because there was a lawsuit filed 
against Mythic Entertainment by a gold farmer in 2001. Gold farmer as in like actual real gold or like gold as an in in game gold that was yeah, farming money gold for and items. Uh, a company called Black Snow Interactive. And they actually sued Mythic Entertainment to try and prevent them from taking down their auctions that they had for gold and items and whatnot on huh. eBay and other various providers. Um, so they actually sued, you know, saying like, these, these are our items. We, we, we got them. We put in the time to get them. They're our, our value. And, and mythic entertainment should not be able to take that away from us. And it's a interesting, interesting argument and definitely also, uh, lays down the framework for a lot of how things turned out today, where generally speaking, you do not, uh, you know, kind of own uh, what that... you have in these online games. Wow. But it started that that lawsuit was one of the early uh, efforts to hammer that out as a legal issue and get a precedent on it. That sounds fantastic, especially because uh, fuck you NFTs. That's really, like, that's really, <laughs> much, really yeah, I feel like you it could is, easily it is tie like the predecessor in. though. Like yeah, uh, MMR NFT and gaming stuff. Yeah, it's like those. Are, that's you can see, you can see the line of people, you know, talking about virtual items and their whether they have value or not, and kind of trace and whether it, you own them or not. Yeah, and trace ownership it from of digital items to NFTs. Also, in the sense that some of the people that are involved with these things are some of the same people, uh, so it's a very interesting. What? Oh, I'm uh, excited for this. Yeah, it's a very interesting sort of arena of online economies. All right, and so the, the, your YouTube channel once again is Computer Gaming. Yesterday, you can go check it out on YouTube. Um, any social media you want to promote, uh, anything else? Any where can people find you? Other than, is, or is there anything other other places other than your YouTube channel? So I am, uh, I am on Mastodon these days. Um, what is my name on there? I think I go generally. You can find me under Matt on Tech. So besides the YouTube channel, what I I do for my my day job is that I am a freelance technology journalist and I write for PC World. I write for Review.com. I write for IEEE Spectrum, um, which if you like Flight Simulator, you should keep an eye out on that publication mm-hmm. over the next few days because you might see something of interest for you. Um, and so that you can find me at all of those places. Um, I occasionally write for IGN and uh, other publications that and um that's where you can catch up on some of my uh either less game related or game adjacent writings Uh, but if you want to find out about pc gaming history just check out computer gaming yesterday that's my main point of contact um for that topic and uh leave a comment you know get in touch like and, comment subscribe yeah yeah <laughs> and uh the next video should be out within uh, i hope the next two weeks or so all right uh as usual for me you can follow me on facebook twitter and instagram at still loading pod on all of them if you want to email me you can email me still loading contact at gmail.com if you want to support the show please give it a five-star rating and review on apple podcast um apparently that doesn't help with the algorithm i've been told that is that that is a lie it does not help with uh visibility but you know what it makes me feel warm and fuzzy so please help me make me make me feel warm and fuzzy uh you can also support the show through patreon patreon.com slash still loading pod for a dollar a month you'll get all the episodes a couple days early at a higher bit rate for four dollars a month you'll get everything at the one dollar tier plus two bonus mini episodes a month uh some of those actually it'll, it'll still be going on by the time this episode comes out i'm exploring one of those like 220 and one handheld gaming consoles that has a lot of you know obviously quality gaming titles so that's been fun to explore some of those strange uh semi bootleg semi not bootleg games uh and then for five dollars a month you'll get everything at the four dollar tier plus access to still bonding which is uh 
Patreon exclusive podcast where two friends, Erica and myself, bond over 007. We're going through every James Bond movie, one movie at a time. They're two and a half to three hours long, so there's a lot of content for you there to check out. And that is all over at patreon.com slash stillloadingpod. But of course, the most important shout out is the Bit by Bit Foundation. The Bit by Bit Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of kids receiving inpatient care at hospitals. So if you want to support them, go to bitbybitfoundation.org and consider donating. That is all I have for you for this week on Still Loading. Matt, thank you once again for joining me. This was a pleasure to talk to you. It was a lot of fun to learn more about this topic. So thank you again for joining me. Thanks for having me on uh, again. And yeah, this was, this was great. It was good times. I'm going to have to have you back on for some other computer related stuff. So I will, I will definitely be reaching back out to you. And with all that said, thank you all for listening and I will see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.